Josh Rubner is the author of this book, Shattered Hopes, Obama's Failure to Broker Israeli-Palestinian Peace from Versa within the last year. He is the policy director of the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation, a national coalition of more than 400 organizations working to end U.S. support for Israel's illegal 47-year military occupation of the Palestinian West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza Strip, and to change U.S. policy towards Israel and the Palestinians to support human rights, international law, and equality. Josh is a former analyst in Middle East Affairs at the Congressional Research Service, a federal government agency providing members of Congress with policy analysis. And we're glad to welcome him here. Thank you, good evening. We've heard quite a lot of powerful testimony from our Palestinian friends like Leila and Anis about the terrible crimes which are being committed against the Palestinian people, most specifically in the Gaza Strip today, and we have much to be outraged by, by these attacks, by these crimes, but we have as much to be outraged by the actions of our government. We need, let's be honest, we need to lay the blame where it belongs for the perpetuation of Israel's oppression of the Palestinian people, and that is at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue and the Capitol Hill. Because, because it is inconceivable, it is inconceivable that Israel would be allowed to get away with what it gets away with without the nearly unconditional military, diplomatic, and political support that we provide to it. And as American taxpayers, and as American citizens, and as decent human beings, we must be outraged by this support. Now what we've seen from the Obama administration and from Congress over the past more than month of these massacres and war crimes has been not a break in U.S. policy, but a continuation of that policy. A continuation of a policy which has backed this brutal and illegal collective punishment in the form of a blockade on the Gaza Strip for now eight years. It's a continuation of a policy which has provided nearly unlimited support for Israel's illegal military occupation of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, for 47 years, and it is a policy which has provided nearly unlimited support for Israel perpetuating and maintaining the rotten fruits of its ethnic cleansing of 1948 and the dispossession of the Palestinian people from their indigenous home. Now, the State Department hasn't said that Israel is committing the State Department hasn't said that Israel is committing war crimes. The State Department has said that Israel is acting in self-defense. And when a journalist at a daily State Department briefing questioned whether Palestinians might actually also have the right of self-defense, this is what the State Department said, that it was, quote, offensive. It was offensive to consider that Palestinians might have the right of self-defense. John Kerry, our esteemed Secretary of State, called Israel's actions, called Israel's actions, quote, appropriate and legitimate. Appropriate and legitimate. The United States was the only country in the entire world to vote against the UN Human Rights Council establishing a commission of inquiry which would look into the actions not only of Israel, but of Hamas as well. Why did the State Department vote against this resolution? According to the Obama administration, it was, quote, one-sided 
and unbalanced. And when President Obama expresses concerns about Palestinian civilian casualties, he is crying crocodile tears. Because the reality is that he has allowed Israel to draw from U.S. stockpiles of weapons in Israel the same 120 millimeter artillery shells and 40 millimeter grenade launchers that Israel has been using to such devastating effect to commit these war crimes in the first place. You cannot sympathize with civilian fatalities when you are responsible for them. themselves against these flimsy Palestinian rockets in the form of Iron Dome, which according to the Israeli military has a 90% success rate. Israelis face virtually no danger from these rockets. Yet, on the other hand, we provide Israel more than $3.1 billion in our taxpayer dollars every year to provide Israel, get this, since 2000, more than 800 million weapons and rounds of ammunition. The F-16 fighter jets, the Apache helicopter gunships, the Hellfire missiles, the joint direct attack munitions, the naval gunboats, all of these are paid for by us, making us directly complicit in these crimes. But today something very interesting happened, if you read the Wall Street Journal. Today something happened that actually hasn't happened since 1982. And that was the United States froze the delivery of a particular weapon system to Israel. According to the Wall Street Journal, the Obama administration has now frozen the supply of these Hellfire missiles to the state of Israel and agreed to scrutinize future weapons transfers at the highest level of the administration. Now, let's be very clear about why this turning point has occurred. Is it because President Obama woke up this morning and discovered that he had a backbone? Did the people of the United States wake up and decide that its foreign policy would be based on morality? No. This is not how politics worked. The reason why we are seeing something that hasn't occurred since 1982 is because of your efforts. Is because of your efforts. Is because of the fact that hundreds of thousands of Americans have been out on the street protesting vigorously our support for Israel's war crimes against the Palestinians. It's because we are being visible and we will not be silenced. This is how things change. Now, what do we do to continue to build upon this growing strength? The fact that more and more of U.S. public opinion is with us and agrees, especially, especially the youth, especially the youth. What do we do to build upon this? Number one, we have to do what the late great Palestinian intellectual, Professor Edward Said, asked us to do, and that's to speak about Palestine everywhere and talk about it to everyone. We need to talk about it in our schools. We need to talk about it in our labor unions. We need to talk about it in our mosques. We need to talk about it in our churches. And yeah, we need to talk about it in our synagogues as well. Because the reality of the situation, the reality of the situation is that Israel's war crimes against the Palestinian people are wrong regardless of the religion of the people of that country. They would be wrong if the people of Israel were Muslim or Christian or Hindu or atheist or none of the above. Because war crimes are war crimes and they are illegal. So in addition, 
In addition to speaking about Palestine everywhere and forcing this issue and keeping Israel's apologists on their back heels, which they clearly are, Israel has clearly lost the debate. Its supporters in the United States have clearly lost control of the discourse. In addition to this, and I know this might not be so popular in New York City, uh, is Anthony Weiner here by any chance? <laughs> no, Anthony didn't show up, who denies the fact that there is an Israeli occupation. Well, this might not be such a popular thing to say in New York City, but the reality is that we need to engage our public officials and tell them enough is enough. enough. If we don't, if we don't, we shrug our shoulders, if we give up, if we say the Israel lobby is too strong and too powerful, then what's the dynamic that we've created? We've created a dynamic where the only people who are members of Congress are hearing from are people who are in the Israel lobby. And now some of you might consider the traditional forms of lobbying a little too tame for your likes. Let a thousand flowers bloom. I think you all know how to step up the tactics and step up the tactics we need to do. Now, when we did this congressional briefing, which you just saw Layla speak at, I went into the hall. We actually had so many people attend that we actually ran two briefings in a row to accommodate everyone who wanted to hear about what was actually going on in Gaza. And in the break between, I went out in the hall, and who did I run into but Representative Elliot Engel of New York City. I don't think he'll be in the House tonight. And I said to him, Representative Engel, it is time to end military aid to Israel. And he looked at me kind of shocked. He looked at me kind of shocked. Like he didn't hear me correctly. He's like, did you say end aid to Israel? No, I support increasing aid to Israel. And I told him that he had the blood of hundreds of Palestinian children on his hands. And you know what he did? He just shrugged it off and got on the elevator. Another day of business in Congress. So we've got to work on our elected officials and we've got our work cut out for us, that's for sure. But the other thing we need to do is we need to listen and respond to what Palestinians are asking us to do to help them lift the boot of oppression off of their necks. And that is to engage in campaigns of boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Because let me be very clear. Let me be very clear about something. Israel has to pay a price for what it's doing. It has to pay a price. Otherwise, there's no motivation on its part to change these brutal policies. And we make it pay a price by engaging in cultural boycotts. We make it pay a price through academic boycotts. We make it pay a price when our institutions divest their funds, often from US corporations, which are profiteering off of Israel's oppression of the Palestinian people. Because the reality, when you look at the end of apartheid in South Africa, it wasn't until white South African society had paid that price, had become international pariahs, that policy change was possible. And I'm convinced, I'm convinced that we are seeing that very same process occur right now. And I know for certain, for certain, that it's only after Israel ends its separate and unequal apartheid policies toward the Palestinian people, can we begin to even think about having a just and lasting peace. Thank you very much. There's a battle going on. 
to allow people to speak the truth about Israel right now. On August 2nd, the Evanston Public Library, that's in Illinois, canceled a scheduled reading by Ali Abu Nima from his book, The Struggle for Justice in Palestine. Stephen Salita, an accomplished and well-reviewed professor, was offered a teaching job at UC Illinois Champaign-Urbana. That offer was revoked without explanation, but with reports that the reason was tweets like, when will the attack on Gaza end? What is left for Israel to prove? Who is left for Israel to kill? This is the logic of genocide. Students for Justice in Palestine has been on the cutting edge of this battle. At Northeastern, SJP was banned for passing out faux eviction notices that exposed how Israel displaces Palestinian families from their homes with hardly any notice. At Barnard, the administration took down an SJP banner that said, Stand with Justice in Palestine. Here to talk about this battle from Students for Justice in Palestine and their work is Susie Abdel Ghaffar and Monica Murillo from John Jay College right here in New York City. is the former president of Campus Democrats, and Susie is the current president of Students for Justice in Palestine at John Jay. Thank you. I have to say, I'm a little embarrassed that the Democrats were mentioned. <laughs> He was a Colombian American who was absolutely destroyed by what's going on in Gaza and Palestine. <laughs> this is not about race. It is not about religion. It is not about ethnicity. This is about oppression. This is about a set of people that have been put into a corner and pummeled without any shame. This is colonialism. It is imperialism. Latin America has been very, very open in stating that it is not okay. We have taken out ambassadors and consulates from Israel and placed them in Palestine where they really belong. Evo Morales, the president of Bolivia, said, Israel is a terrorist state. He took the words right out of my mouth. We are talking about war crimes. And our conformity as Americans is really disgusting and it's a shame. Us as taxpayers, we need to hold those who have the power accountable. Josh Rubner was talking about our elected officials and me calling myself a Democrat is extremely embarrassing. It is, it is, it's disgraceful. And us as taxpayers, we need to be out in the streets letting these officials in any way possible know that we will not continue to stand for this. This is not the only thing we can do though. Again, we've been hearing speakers all night talk about boycott, divest, and sanctions. If we were to pull all our, our money together and see how much we're spending on products that, are, that support Israeli settlements, we would probably all sit here and cry. We need to realize that one of the most powerful things that we have in a capitalist society is the power as consumers and where we spend our money. We need to be conscious. We need to be aware of where the money that we're going to when we buy Coke, when we buy Revlon, when we buy Victoria's Secret, when we buy all these Zionist products is going to. Because if we're buying these, we are just as guilty as the CEOs that are supporting Israel. We need to divest from all and any single organization, institution, 
anything that is Zionist, whether it's academic or any in any other way, shape, or form. And we need to sanction. Israel needs to pay for the disgrace of war crimes that they are committing. But it's not just Israel. I've said this before and I will say it again. This country, our beloved, so human rights friendly, so all justice and equal, America is probably even more at fault because Israel wouldn't survive without that $3.1 billion annual aid that we give them. We also have to remember that this is not necessarily a conflict, it's an occupation. It is not a conflict. It's a conflict between two equal sides. There is no equality in this picture. It's oppressed versus oppressor. We must, and we must take that narrative and own it. I, as a Colombian American, can speak and can connect to this conflict when I go to the border and see my Latin American brothers and sisters being supported. It is the same imperialist, colonialist factors that are going into this that are playing out in Palestine and in Israel. Because it is this country, it is our beloved, again, so quote unquote human rights friendly country. All equality for all, yeah. Let's call ourselves hypocrites, because that's what we really are. Or our government hypocritical, because that's what they really are. And we must support resistance. We must support every single movement that's working for freedom and for liberty and for justice in Palestine. And for justice anywhere in the world. Because, it's again, the same imperialist, colonialist forces that are doing things, like, that are allowing these human crisis, humanitarian crises to happen all over the world. Again, let's look at our own borders, as well as the borders in Gaza. Even though we may disagree with some of the more radical, as you may call it, movements in, in the fight for justice for Palestine, that doesn't mean we should outright not support them. Again, someone else said it, I'm not a Hamas fan, I'm not a Hamas cheerleader, but I understand that they are resisting. They are putting up the fight that others don't have the, the heart to, the courage to. And we, we should not be condemning them for this. We should not be condemning them for this. I'll end with this. We must realize that the movement is stronger if we are together. Nelson Mandela reminded us that our freedom is not complete without the liberation of Palestine. And Martin Luther King reminded us that, the li that <clears throat> injustice ev everywhere is a threat to injustice everywhere. So we need to keep this in mind in our fight. Thank you, have a great night. Um, I feel a bit awkward coming up here after Josh Rubner and Fida and every other amazing speaker. Um, but I am the president of John Jay College's Students for Justice in Palestine. And thank you. So at last week's protest, I began my speech saying this. I stand here in front of you all today as a motherless child. It has been nine years since I have seen my mother's face, nine years since I have smelled her scent, nine years of carrying that burden, and nine years of facing a society that has, been, has, that has seen me as nothing more than a lost cause, such as Palestinians have to deal with. And the last time I saw her, I did not see her but a still white body. And for nine years, I have carried this traumatizing image in my head. If I, as a somewhat privileged, because we are all privileged sitting here, we all have a home to go to at the end of this event, we all have a bed to go to. So if I, as a privileged, born and bred Egyptian American, still carry this burden and still struggle with it, 
I can't even begin to imagine the baggage the Palestinian people are carrying. So today, although I am not a Palestinian by blood, I am Palestinian by heart. We are all Palestine. And at every other protest, I yell at everyone who's not chanting, and I say, if you're not losing your voice by the end of this protest, you are doing something wrong. <laughs> and I point out the people, too, that I'm speaking directly at. But <laughs> I also say that I stand here, and I am ashamed to call myself an American. But at the same time, I am ashamed to call myself an Egyptian. So what is the only thing that I am proud to call myself? and that's a human being. So being only a sophomore and being only 19 years old, I understood that I, it would be very difficult to take on the presidency role, especially when I've never been an executive before. And before really deciding whether or not I wanted to be a part of John Jay College's SJP, there were a countless number of ideas flowing into my head that were convincing me not to join. One of them being, am I going to have time? The second one, is it worth my time? Will joining this, well, joining this is not going to save Palestine. And my ultimate favorite that I hear from every other younger person around me is, I won't be able to get a job if my face is on a Palestinian protest. So, what do we do when not just me, but a lot of younger people are thinking? Although I had a countless number of questions and ideas that were convincing me not to join and not to be the face of John Jay College's SJP, it only took one idea for me to realize that I needed to be president of John Jay's SJP, and it was this. Palestinians use each and every second to fight for their rights, so why shouldn't I? Palestinians can't waste any time because at any moment they can be bombed or, suck or shot, so why should I? And joining this will not bring back the thousands of Palestinians, of the dead Palestinians from the grave, but it will create awareness. And when people are aware, we boycott, we divest, and we sanction until Israel pays for its crimes. And just like my mother is not a number to me, Palestinians shouldn't be looked at as numbers to everyone else. The worst part of this all is, like Mona and where should the birds fly, we as younger people, including me, and I am totally guilty of this, we have grown numb to seeing a Palestinian child with no legs, a Palestinian mother holding her dead child in her hands, screaming, why? It has become the norm, and we've completely normalized it as the youth, which is completely dis disappointing. But again, being an activist, if we felt every single pain for the people that we fight their rights for, we would just kill ourselves. So what do we do? Like Mona, the 10-year-old girl, we grow up, and we look at these pictures, and we stare at these videos, and we don't feel anything. So what we do with John Jay's SJP, what we do nationally for John Jay, S or, I'm sorry, for SJP is we make sure that it does not become the norm, that we fight every single day until Palestinians are liberated, until Palestinians can walk outside of their house without feeling danger, and until we can hear the laughter. I recently actually quit my job because someone decided to say, Palestine, what do you mean? Palestine doesn't exist. And I you know, took my bag and headed out the door and I was like, this job's not for me. <laughs> but one of our biggest challenges as a student organization is connecting the Palestinian struggles to our own personal struggles because let's face it, a large group of people will not fight for a cause unless it has something to do with them. So we continue to fight and we will not stop. And I, and 
and I made my club members actually take a swear, and not a promise, but a swear to put their left hand on their heart and their right hand up in the air to solemnly swear that they will not stop until justice is served and until Palestinians are free one day. Thank you all.